Very good to see everyone. It's a blessing to be with you and to be able to study the Word of God with you to worship together. I invite you to open to Luke 22. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22. And the hymn that Chris selected could not have been more appropriate for the lesson as we study a lesson titled The Body and Blood of Our Lord. In Luke 22, we want to read verses 14 down through 20 and notice this occasion where the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. In Luke 22, verse 14, it says, When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And when we read this, we probably take it for granted that we have knowledge of it, that we have a familiarity with it because of the way that we have been taught, because of perhaps even the culture we've been brought up in, the family we've been brought up in because of attending services over the years, because there are millions upon millions of people who don't know about this, don't understand about the Lord, about our sacrifice, about the implications that that means for their lives. There are millions of people who are groping for the Lord. Remember Acts chapter 17? Acts chapter 17, when Paul was at Athens and that city was wholly given over to idolatry, he began to speak to the people there at the Areopagus and to explain about the one true God. And in Acts 17, verse 26, beginning, he said this, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. There are people who are looking for peace, contentment, fulfillment, for purpose in their life, but they don't have it. They're like these Athenians. There are people who are living in sin, bearing up under the guilt, the sorrow, the pain that comes with that sin, and they're seeking some kind of relief they're seeking to be improved or, or to be better, to, to be relieved of the burden that they are carrying around. And so they are in spiritual darkness. And they are ignorant of the fact or the details of how it is they could come to the Lord and be forgiven of their sin. They're ignorant of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we are blessed because we have the light of truth because we have it here for us to read about, to know about. We have been blessed for others to teach us about these things. We're blessed to have a record of his sacrifice. We're blessed to know, as Paul did, that Jesus Christ gave himself for us. As Paul talked about in Galatians 2, verse 20, he gave himself for me. He gave himself for you. For you, individually, personally, he gave himself for you. And we're blessed to have a knowledge of that, to understand that the Lord has loved us to that degree. And we are privileged to be able to remember through the observance of the memorial that he has established, the sacrifice that he gave for us as we have already done this morning. We want to study in some detail about the memorial given for the body and blood of our Lord so we may please God when we observe it. 
and not take these things for granted. Let's go now and begin a study of what it is not to start with. Because there are some misunderstandings associated with the Lord's Supper. And let's go to John 6, John chapter 6. We want to understand that the Lord's Supper is not for our salvation. The passage in John 6, some of which we read just a few moments ago, is often cited when we are at the Lord's table. And it's cited with the idea as it talks about the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it helps us to think about the fact that He would give a sacrifice, but we want to notice the context of it here and what it is that the Lord is speaking about. In John 6, verse 47, let's read all the way down through 58. John 6, 47, down through verse 58. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. <clears throat> the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. <clears throat> He who eats this bread will live forever. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we want to understand is the Lord is not telling us that if we eat the unleavened bread and we drink the fruit of the vine, that that is eternal life or that leads to eternal life. In other words, it's not a condition necessarily of salvation in that sense because there are some like the Roman Catholic Church that believe that it is a sacrament to partake of unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine they believe there is something holy and righteous as far as cleansing you and making you acceptable before God in the same way that we might consider asking God to forgive us of our sins or being baptized for the remission of sins. They have that kind of concept. And we want to understand the Lord is not telling them here, well, you know, one day if you just partake of the Lord's Supper, you'll be forgiven of your sins and have everlasting life. Rather, what he is talking about is this contrast between the physical bread in the wilderness that their fathers had eaten and they ate it and it gave them physical sustenance. But eventually they died in the wilderness. And he's saying that if you eat of me, I'm the bread of life, you'll have eternal life. If you drink of my blood, you will have eternal life. And again, he's not referring specifically to the Lord's Supper here. He's talking about himself. As he later said here, whoever eats my blood, drinks my flesh, abides in me and I in him, in verse 56. Remember that he had told them previously, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. He's trying to get their minds off this physical and focusing on the spiritual. It's similar to John chapter 15, if you notice this. John chapter 15 where he gives essentially the same idea with a different illustration. In John chapter 15, verse 4, beginning, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me 
you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and wither, then they are gathered them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. In both passages, he's talking about partaking of him, drawing nourishment out of him, drawing strength out of him. So he's not referring to partaking of the Lord's Supper and having eternal life through partaking of that, though we know that as a child of God that is our duty, that is our responsibility, and if we neglect to do that, we are in sin, we understand that. But what he's telling them is, you need to partake of me. And he put it in language, by the way, that these Jews, when they heard it, were offended. Because he's talking about eating flesh and drinking blood. And so that bothered them. But Jesus often put things in a way that would offend those who didn't have good and honest hearts, but would still draw those who wanted to honor him and to please him. So he's telling them, partake of me. Partake of me and you will have eternal life. But then also we want to notice in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. How that the partaking of the Lord's Supper is not a common meal. In Acts 2 verse 42, remember it says there, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now there are four elements of worship that are mentioned there. The apostles' doctrine is the teaching. The fellowship is the sharing together. And that's what we do when we contribute on the first day of the week. We are sharing together. In the partaking of the bread, that is the Lord's Supper and then the prayers. The breaking of bread came to be a shortened way of describing the Lord's Supper. Because we break bread together. So it's the breaking of bread. And we'll look in just a moment how that similar language in Acts chapter 20. But notice the contrast between Acts 2 verse 42 and Acts 2 verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So in 2.42, he's talking about these different parts of worship that they were doing together. Here's the worship that they were practicing. Then he says in verse 46, they're doing something else. They're at the temple worshiping, but then they go from house to house to eat their meals. That's the social aspect of the brethren spending time together, encouraging one another, getting to know each other. So there's the partaking of the Lord's Supper, that's a part of worship, and then there are the common meals they eat from house to house. Notice also 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, as we think about the Lord's Supper, it's not a common meal, that the Corinthian church had perverted it and made it into a common meal, and that drew a rebuke from the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's what they thought they were doing. That's what they claimed they were doing. But he's saying, you're not really doing that. 4, verse 21, In eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God which you, and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. And then in verse 23, he begins to tell them and remind them, here's what the Lord's Supper is. It's not what you're doing, but here's what it is. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also... He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So there's what the Lord's Supper is. So it's not a common meal as the Corinthians have been practicing. You jump down to verse 34. He tells them this, But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So eat your common meals at home. Don't eat them in the assembly. That's not what you're to do when you come together. You're to observe 
the Lord's Supper. It's a sacred occasion, not a secular or social occasion. So the Lord's Supper is not a common meal. The Lord's Supper is not the most important part of worship. There are some who have that concept. In Acts 2.42, it's put there with other parts of worship, with the prayers, the teaching, the giving together. In Ephesians 5.19, we're told to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There are five parts of worship that the New Testament outlines for us. And all of them are equally important. All of them are equally sacred. We need to respect all those things because there are people who get the idea that they can come and when the Lord's Supper served, they've met their duty and they can leave and everything's okay. Now, sometimes do people have to get up and leave for various reasons? Yes, I understand that. They might have to leave in the middle of the sermon for one reason or another. But we never want to get the concept that the Lord's Supper is the most important part of our worship. It is important, but prayer is important. Study is important. Giving is important. Teaching, all these things are important. Singing to one another. These are all things that are a part of the worship that we're commanded to do on the first day of the week. Now let's look at the purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper. Why do we do that? Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 16. Let's begin to think about this to realize that there is symbolism given to us in the Old Testament that would point forward and help us to understand about the Lord's Supper, about the Lord's sacrifice for us. In Leviticus chapter 16, and it begins to talk about the Day of Atonement here. And we want to notice verses 15 and 16 as Moses describes this to the people. Leviticus 16 verse 15. It's saying of Aaron and the sacrifice that is to be made, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their trans transgressions for all their sins and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So this day of atonement offering a sacrifice on behalf of the children of Israel because of all the sins that they have committed. And the idea is that a sacrifice had to be made because of their sins. And because this was done year after year, as the Hebrew writer points out, these animal sacrifices were insufficient. But it is giving the idea that a blood sacrifice is needed. There is a life that is required. But these animals are insufficient. If you go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And notice as the Passover is instituted here. Exodus 12 verses 12 and 13. Remember the judgment is going to come on the land of Egypt. The firstborn are doomed to death unless there is that blood that is sprinkled on the doorposts and the lintels. And in Exodus 12, verse 12, it says this, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So there is a judgment that is coming. And for them to escape that judgment, they had to offer a sacrifice of this lamb, take its blood, and put it on the doorpost and on the lentils. And when the angel of death came through, he would pass over that home. So the judgment would be escaped. It would be avoided. Otherwise, they would be subject to that same judgment. So we jump forward now to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, thinking about the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice that is offered 
because of the sins of the people. Think about the Passover with the judgment that is coming for that judgment to pass over them. In John chapter 1, John 1 verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those Old Testament sacrifices foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ. And so they were pointing forward to the Lamb of God who is innocent, but the sacrifice that would be all-sufficient. The blood that would be shed so that our sins can be forgiven so that judgment will pass over us. The Son of God suffered and died for us. We read that in Luke 22. We read that in Mark earlier in the observance of the memorial. We understand that he suffered and he died and that blood poured forth from his body so that you and I might be redeemed from our sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, we go back to what we read just a moment ago and refresh our memory about something that is said there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's notice first of all verse 24. As the apostle says, the Lord delivered this to me, he told me about the Lord's Supper. He told me about what he said on that night. And it's very interesting that the Apostle Paul received this revelation as the other apostles had been there with the Lord on that occasion. And Apostle Paul later has this revealed to him what was said. But verse 24, he says, This is what the Lord told me, that he took the bread and said to the people, said to the disciples who were there, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In verse 25, he took the cup, he gave him the cup. This is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we partake of it to be reminded of that sacrifice. That is what we are to be dwelling on about his love about how that he gave himself for us, that he suffered and died so that we can be forgiven of our sins. We need to be reminded of the need for his sacrifice. That if it was just me and there was no sacrifice, I would be doomed to eternal torment. When I'm partaking of that Lord's Supper, I need to be reminded I needed that. I need to be grateful for it. We need to be convicted of His resurrection. As Paul says here, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. You're proclaiming that you believe that He died for a purpose, for a reason, that that death had true power, that it might bring about my redemption. But till he comes, connect that together, that means he rose from the dead. When I partake of the Lord's Supper, I'm not just declaring that he simply died and that was it. I'm declaring he lives. That's what gives it power. It's because he has been raised from the dead and proved to be the Son of God. So I partake of that looking forward to the time that he is going to return. I am confident he's going to return. When I partake of the Lord's Supper, that's what I'm declaring to the world. I believe in His sacrifice. I believe there is power in that sacrifice to forgive me. I believe He was raised from the dead. I believe He is returning. And so when we partake of that Lord's Supper, we have to partake of it with great reverence. As Paul talks about here, continuing on in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We understand that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we must do so with the right frame of mind. He is not telling us here, examine yourself to see if you have lived a righteous and pure life this past week. And if you have, you can partake of it. If you haven't, you can't. 
But there are a lot that misunderstand what he's saying, examine yourself. The context is examine myself to make sure I'm thinking about his sacrifice. I'm not thinking about me, my, my sin, my righteousness, whether I've lived faithfully and purely this past week. How many times could we partake of it if it depended on whether or not we lived sin-free the past week? He's talking about examine the body of the Lord, the blood of the Lord. That's what we are to be thinking on instead of, as the Corinthians had did, perverting it into a social occasion, to a common meal. Their minds were not on the sacrifice of the Lord is the point. When you partake of the Lord's Supper, it must be on His sacrifice. We also realize that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, there are only two elements that are essential to the Lord's Supper. If we go back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And let's notice here the occasion on which the Lord instituted this memorial. It says in Matthew 26 verse 17, Now on the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare you prepare for you to eat the Passover, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he took that bread and broke it and gave it to them. So one element is unleavened bread. And we, that's why we use, if you will, the cracker as opposed to loaf bread or other types of bread. It's because it was on the occasion of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then he goes on to talk about, verses 28 and 29, you take of this cup, and he talks about then the fruit of the vine. And the Jewish Passover, they would have had grape juice on the table. And it's unfermented grape juice because they were to get all fermentation out, so it was not fermented. It's grape juice that is there sitting on their table, and the Lord says, take that and eat it, or drink it, rather. So unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, those are the two elements of the Lord's Supper. There are some brethren who want to try to put in a third element, which is the actual physical cup itself. That's not a vital and essential part of the Lord's Supper. Whether it's in one cup or many cups, it's still the cup because it's the grape juice. Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine are the two elements of the Lord's Supper. And by the way, in all these passages, including the one in Luke that we read, there is a specific order that is laid out. Partake of the bread and then the fruit of the vine. That's why we partake of the bread first and then the fruit of the vine. In Luke it said that he took the cup and he passed it out to him. But then it comes back and says he gave him the bread and told him the meaning, this is my body, which is given for you. And then he took the cup, or he referenced the cup, and he said, you drink it, this is my blood of the new covenant. So on these occasions, we see there is the unleavened bread and then the fruit of the vine. But we know as well that we partake of it on the first day of the week. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. And notice verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7. It says, Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So again, that's another occasion where the observance of the Lord's Supper has been summed up in break bread. They came together on the first day of the week. It's not saying to eat a common meal together. It's saying they came together to worship together. That's why Paul stayed for those days and waited for the assembly of the brethren. And he gathered with them and he broke bread with them, partaking of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And we realize that this is the example that is given to us. It tells us this is when we partake of it. It's consistent with the rest of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 16, when we are gathered on the first day of the week, we take up a collection. And so we follow that example. We follow that authority in the New Testament. 
when we come together on the first day of the week, we observe the Lord's Supper. And that's the only day that we are to observe and authorized to observe the Lord's Supper. So we understand the purpose, the point, the meaning behind the Lord's Supper and that we need to follow the New Testament because there are many who do not follow it. They may observe the communion once a year, twice a year, quarterly or monthly. They observe it sometimes when they have weddings or they do it on a Thursday night or a Friday night or a Saturday night. That's becoming much more popular. But when we examine the New Testament, we realize none of that is involved. None of that is authorized. We have to take it on the first day of the week, focusing on the sacrifice of our Lord, what He did for us, and only on the first day of the week. And the elements that have been revealed to us. If you will, open to number 837. 837. <laughs> And again, let's be mindful that there are millions upon millions, even billions of people who don't understand about the Lord's Supper. They are in spiritual darkness and they're seeking for something that we maybe take for granted. Let's appreciate the fact that we have the spiritual light. We have the Word of God. We have the truth that has been revealed to us that we can understand about the sacrifice of the Lord and we can be informed about partaking of the memorial each week that we may be focused, that we may be reminded of what our Lord has done for us and to keep us humble and appreciative of that relationship that we sustain to Him. And let's remember that we first show gratitude to the Lord and appreciation for His sacrifice by submitting our lives to Him. As someone who's never obeyed the gospel, if you're here today, you've never become a Christian, you never acknowledge that Christ is Lord, that Jesus is the Son of the living God. You've never publicly confessed that. You've never turned away from your sins. You've never been baptized to have your sins washed away. Then won't you do that this morning because the Lord gave Himself for you and you have been spared to this point in time that you can be forgiven of your sin. If you will but come forward to confess your faith in Him, turning away from that sin and be baptized, you can be His. And then you can participate in the memorial remembering what He has done for you. And as a child of God, if you have allowed that to slip away, if you have neglected to truly appreciate the body and blood of our Lord, then won't you repent of that this morning? If there is something you need to confess publicly, then we invite you to do that. And we will pray with you. We will pray for you that your relationship may be restored to Him again. So if you have a need, won't you come forward while we stand in singing?